Welcome to Osteo. That's with a capital T-E-A, where osteo warriors in treatment and recent survivors spill the tea on all things osteosarcoma and cancer from the adolescent and young adult cancer patient perspective. Listen in on our honest and personal conversations about our osteo experiences, stories, and who knows what else. This podcast discusses all aspects of the young adult cancer experience in a conversational format. Conversations and language will be appropriate for listeners age 18 and over. Audience discretion is advised. Like and follow MIB agents on social media for all of the hot intel. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first ever episode of Osteo, the Osteosarcoma podcast. Yay! I am so excited to go on this journey with everyone and spill the tea on everything you could possibly imagine when it comes to cancer and osteosarcoma. And I am, of course, joined by my three lovely co-hosts, Mia, Vicky, and Kerrigan. Say hey. Hello. Hi. Um, So we are going to be hosting Osteo um, once a month in place of the regularly scheduled Osteo Bites. Um, It should be the last Thursday of each month, but it's going to be a little wonky with Factor coming up in June. Um, Yeah. A little bit about us, we are currently serving on MIB's Junior Advisory Board of 2022, and that's how we all met. Um, Basically, what we do on the Junior Advisory Board is we are (laughs) juniors and we give, we're advising MIB and just, you know, talking about things that we think could help people in the osteo world, and we think this could help. All right, so we are going to dive on into our first segment, which we will open every episode with, and it is called, What's the Tea? No, like literally. Literally. So I guess I'll start us off. Um, I'll give you a little introduction. So What's the Tea? No, literally um, is basically we're all going to go around. We're all drinking some tea or beverages, and we're going to give our honest review about it and let you know if you should try it. Um, So today I am drinking Stee's Antioxidant Brew. It's organic green tea, zero calorie, peach mango flavored. And let me just give it a little taste. Little sniff, little taste. It's not too sweet. It's kind of smooth. Um, Kind of giving like a little Starbucks iced tea moment. Mm -hmm. I like think I'd give her a seven out of ten. Pretty good. Solid. Good. Fair rating. All right. Who else? Um, have? I have regular English breakfast tea. Um, I was drinking it in the the meeting we were having for the junior advisor before this. So there's not that much left, but classic English breakfast tea, milk, sugar. I'd say solid mm-hmm. eight out of ten. Definitely a comfort drink. Love it. I am currently sipping on some black coffee that I have hit with some chocolate metabolism powder, but it's not one of those like bad diet detox metabolism powders. It's actually good for you and it's not super duper high in fiber and it just tastes good because it's chocolate and it's not too sweet. Um, But unfortunately I have had it for about the past hour. So it is lukewarm. So I, while it was hot, I would give it a solid like eight and a half out of 10. But right now, I'd say it's a solid six. Mm. Mm. Understandable rating. I am drinking smart water. You cannot go wrong with smart water. The reason why I'm drinking it is because I really want to sound intelligent today. And I want to have all my stuff together. Mm. And I want to make sure that I sound good. Um, I rate it classic, maybe six out of 10. Um, I've had better water. But uh, the ingredients are water. And uh, classic. Yeah classic so good such a classic all right our next segment of the podcast is we are each going to tell a little bit of our story with cancer and osteosarcoma so I will go ahead and kick it off so my name is Camille I'm 19 I was born in Boston Massachusetts I'm the youngest of three girls um Currently, I am a freshman at Boston University. I'm studying psychology and I'm minoring in theater, which is fun. Um, 
yeah, like I said, I'm the youngest of three girls. Life was pretty normal. Um, I grew up Irish dancing. It was my first love. Um, and in 2012, at about age nine, I was at the peak of my Irish dancing career. I was attending classes three to four times a week, rehearsing for like 12 hours. It was intense. It was intense for anyone, let alone a nine-year-old. But um, I was training for the New England region, Oroctus, which is like our regional competition. Um, and I was competing in solos and I was also competing in teams. So yeah, it was pretty crazy and pretty intense. Um, so that was about fall of 2012. And one day at class, I started having pain in my right leg. And, uh, you know, it was so intense that I had to like, I just remember stepping out of like the stamina uh, warm ups we were doing. And I was just like in the corner, like in a ball. And the teacher was like, you know, like, get up, get up. They were really strict. And I was like, this something is wrong. But I just kind of assumed that it was just a dancer's injury. I mean, you know, no one really thinks that it's anything more than that, especially when you're, you know, training as much as I was. Oh, yeah. Then another day um, at class, I was lacing up my dance shoe and I felt a bump on the top of my shin, mm -hmm. which was never a good sign. Never a good sign. It's always um, the bump. Get, get your bumps and lumps checked out, people. Seriously. No, for real. If anything from this, it's that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my, my parents were in the healthcare field, and basically one of my mom's friends was like, I don't like lumps or bumps on children. Take her to the ER tomorrow and get her appointment moved up because... Earlier, I went to the pediatrician, got an x-ray. It was very concerning. And I had an appointment scheduled with a orthopedic doctor two weeks out. But no, like they were like, you need to go to the ER and move this up. So the next morning after that, um, it was about January. Um, and about 8 a.m., I was not going to school. I was not going to the fourth grade. I was at the Boston Children's ER. Um, and that visit prompted an MRI, which later led to a bone biopsy. And in January of 2013, I received my diagnosis of metastatic osteosarcoma. It was taking up three fourths of my tibia bone um, and it already had spread to my lungs by the time it was discovered. So in February, 2013, I had my port placed and I began MAP, which for those of you that don't know, that is uh, a protocol involving methotrexate, um, doxorubicin, and cisplatin. Very fun medications. Um, awful. Not awful. awful. Uh, <laughs> the worst. <laughs> and, for Doc real. Doxo like, and cisplatin are considered the two most toxic chemotherapy drugs that are on the market. Don't they call one of them the red devil? That would be doxo. Yep, that would be doxorubicin. Cool aid. Yeah, so I, I was so young. I was 10. But so things are a little bit foggy for me, but I do know one thing. It fucking sucked. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it was pretty god awful. Um, you know, everything that happens in cancer treatment, you know, the nausea, the hair loss, the extreme fatigue, the social isolation, even in the fourth grade, I was feeling it. Um, but you know, the one time I really broke down was when I had to talk about my surgical options. Um, you know, my orthopedic surgeon, she said, I have two options. I can either have a below the knee amputation or have limb salvage. And I was like, Ooh, limb salvage sounds interesting. Um, then she told me the downside to limb salvage, which was no running, no jumping, no high impact activities, which meant I could no longer Irish dance. And that broke me. But at 10, I understood if I had an amputation, the likelihood of me being able to dance with that was kind of unlikely and didn't really seem realistic to me. So I decided to have limb salvage and in April of 2013, I underwent that. Um, that surgery 
showed poor necrosis. So I switched to map IE after that and also had two thoracotomies. Map IE should say that. Um, it's methotrexate, doxorubicin, and cisplatin. And also I phosphamide, I phosphamide and etoposide. So many big cancer medication names. Um, but I finished MAP IE in January of 2014, a year after I was diagnosed. And I was so ready to leave that chapter of my life behind. I had so much hope for the future. And I was just excited to, you know, be moving on up into middle school, live in my little teenage life, but psych, nope. Um, so I had a revision of my limb salvage in May of 2015 after some screws literally snapped in half in my leg. Don't know how that's possible, but it happened to me. Um, so that happened in May and then a CT scan in June showed um, relapse in both my lungs. So I had two thoracotomies back to back within three weeks of each other. Oh and I oh my gosh. went on a clinical trial. Um, which I had a severe allergic reaction to, stopped breathing, and I obviously withdrew from it. Um, yeah, so this is where everything kind of gets a little fuzzy in my story, um, and this is kind of where I start struggling with mental health. Um, I, after my little clinical trial incident a few months later, I was diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and, you know, kind of started therapy um, and stuff for that. Um, and in saying this, I feel like mental health is very important to talk about in terms of cancer, um, something that's often overlooked and not really talked about. Um, and, you know, you'll be hearing a lot of mental health stuff from me because it's very relevant in my story. But anyway, um, after my relapse in 2015, I relapsed in 2016, 2017, 2020, and twice in 2021. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, there were so many treatment protocols from chemo pills to knee pack, um, mostly surgery. Um, and you know, also going off the mental health thing, this really impacted my adolescence, you know, like, those years were kind of the years where you come into who you are. And while others my age were, you know, partying, <laughs> joining sports teams, um, participating in, you know, clubs, um, I was in the hospital on debilitating treatments or recovering from procedures. And I just really felt powerless and like I had no control. <laughs> Camille, what is MEPAC? So MEPAC is this immunotherapy that is actually not FDA approved in the United States. Um, but however, it is used in practically every other country as standardized osteosarcoma treatment. Um, so my oncology team and my family petitioned the FDA for me to have compassionate use of it. And we ultimately got it and I got the treatment. And yeah, that's what MEPAC is. Apparently it's supposed to improve survival rates a little bit. Um, I did progress on it though, and I didn't really finish the treatment protocol, but you know, that's okay. Um, so yeah, a lot of treatment for me, um, a lot of surgery. And most recently I relapsed in September of 2021. Um, and I recently underwent SBRT um, radiation in January. Um, yeah, and here I am today. I am currently, as I said earlier, studying psychology and theater at Boston University. I'm in the last week of classes for this semester, my first semester at college. Mm -hmm. Never thought I would get here, but one day I hope to work with um, adolescent young adults with disabilities, chronic illness, so, um, or cancer. Um, I'm not really sure if I want to be like a therapist or I don't know, maybe like special ed teacher, still kind of debating. Um, but yeah, um, aside from cancer, because, <laughs> you know, cancer is just one part of my life. Um, I own my own Etsy shop called Camille's Own. I am a big Phoebe Bridgers fan. We love her. Um, I love walking around the city of Boston when I physically can. And yeah, um, I guess what I've learned from cancer, as corny as it sounds, is that 
it is okay to not be okay. Preach. Um, preach. <laughs> um, you know, going to therapy has been extremely helpful for me coming into who I am. Um, I am a big believer in therapy and in mental health, as I mentioned earlier. So you'll be hearing a lot of that from me. Um, but yeah, um, I had the idea to start Osteo kind of based on, you know, my experience um, when I was 10. Um, you know, I really wish that there was a simple answer to questions like, how do I cope with this? Like, you know, like, what's the survival rate? Like, has anyone, you know, gone to college or graduated high school with this disease? And, you know, um, here we are to kind of share our experiences and show you that despite osteosarcoma or cancer or chronic illness, like things like this, like things like these are possible. And Ultimately, it, we're here to remind you that no matter what you're going through, you're not alone. Someone's been there and we're coping through it. So that's a little bit of my story. And I guess I'll hand it over to Mia to talk about your story. Absolutely. And before I start on mine, Cam, I just want to say you have been kicking Osteo's ass for so long and it is so impressive. And I am so honored to not only be your friend, but just to know you. So thank you for getting us started. And that goes for all of you as well. So I'm Mia, I am 23. I live in LA with my mom and our three cats and two dogs uh, and Alf Alfonso as well, who you might see uh, hiding in the background there. Uh, completely forgot he was there until we started. So uh, <laughs> he's just gonna be a part of uh, Osteo, I guess. Um, but so I was actually born in New York City. So go New York, not Boston, boo. Anyway, um, so I was probably the only Jewish baby born in a Catholic hospital on Ash Wednesday. Um, so that's my New York story. Uh, we moved out here when I was four and I've been living in sunny Los Angeles ever since. Um, basically I, you know, went to a K through 12 for, uh, you know, for school. Um, and then I decided to go out of state, uh, for college. And I started at the university of Washington, which is in Seattle. Um, I was there for my freshman year and before classes even started, I had just moved up there. I had just my, joined my sorority and it was a tradition to run through campus with your sorority and I tripped and sprained my knee and it was my right knee and this was in September of 2017 and the sprain had pretty much healed by Halloween of 2017 um, but then it really started hurting again over that winter break and I was like you know what I'm a freshman in college UW is all hills and stairs so is the entire city of Seattle you know, I probably just re-injured my knee. It's no big deal. Yeah, there's some bruising, but you know, that's, you know, similar to a sprain and it hurt in the same area. That's and what they all say. I know. And I just kept walking on it, kept dancing on elevated surfaces and frat basements. You know, I lived <laughs> on the third floor of my sorority. I had a top bunk bed, you know, the whole lot, lot of knee use. So I, I wasn't surprised that I was in pain. I finally went to a doctor in Seattle in April of 2018 when the pain got really bad. Um, he didn't order any scans uh, and just prescribed oh. me with PT because I had a history of a sprain in that area, um, which was a dumbass move on his part to say the least. Um, so and true. In, yeah, in part, I was a bit of a dumbass because I just believed it. Um, I guess, you know, a lot of the times when, when you're our age, you think you're invincible, you know, if, until it happens, <laughs> you know, basically until it happens. Totally. Um, but so I did the PT and it started helping because I learned how to cope with it more. But the real red flag should have been that my knee was hurting even with, when I wasn't using it, even if I was leaning down um, and the swelling was starting to get worse. And it all kind of, you know, came you know to a head when I was in Norway with my family and I was hiking up these 27 flights of stairs right next to a stunning waterfall I mean probably should have been one of the best days of my life and I was miserable going down the stairs and not up and that's when I really knew that something was wrong because I was very very active throughout high school and college um so my mom said you need to get an MRI right when we get home like right, you know, cause Norway, we were I think, nine hours ahead. Um, so right when things opened in the morning, I called and made an appointment. Um, 
And so my GP, uh, my general practitioner, she got me in um, and I've known her for years. Again, I went to a K through 12. Um, I went to the same school as her daughter who was also there K through 12. So she's like my doctor, but also, you know, one of my good friends' moms. So we have each other's number and we always check in on each other. And uh, I was at a friend's house after my MRI and she texted me. She was like, how soon can you get to my office? And I was about 20 minutes away, but I had to drop my friend off first um, at an appointment that she had. So I was like, you know what? I can be there at 4.30. And she said, that's perfect. So I get to the doctor's office. Her daughter's the receptionist that day because it was summer. And I'm chit-chatting with her and everything seems okay. My mom was actually out of town. Normally she goes with me to all my doctor's appointments. Again, I'm 19 at this time. Uh, and I walk into my doctor's office and she's crying. And uh, she shows me an x-ray. So they did x-rays and an MRI. And you know how, you know, the bones are. So you got, you know, the end of your femur and then the end of your tibia, you know, the top part, they're just kind of mm -hmm. here. The proximal part of my right tibia had a huge gray shadow over it and the bone was broken. So I had a two and a half inch tumor in my right proximal tibia that had broken through the bone that I had been walking on for months. Oh my God. Wow. Without realizing that it was broken. Yeah. So it was, it was pretty bad. Um, but thankfully she had some connections at UCLA. I live in LA. Um, so I'm very, very grateful that the hospital that I'm treated at is only nine miles away from my house because some people have to travel even hundreds of miles to get the care that they need. Um, and so they did a bone biopsy on me and it originally came back as benign. So I was a little different than most osteo cases because usually they do chemo to see that the chemo is working on the tumor and then do surgery and then chemo after. But for me, because it was benign, they took the entire tumor out and it hadn't metastasized anywhere. And so when they ended up realizing that it was cancerous, um, they had to start me on chemo with no way to tell if it was working. Mm. Uh, so I went through the nine month map protocol, um, but I had my first, uh, my first round of cisplat. I lost 15% of my hearing, uh, especially in higher frequencies. Um, I had such bad acid reflux that I thought I was having a heart attack and I could only eat shredded rotisserie chicken breast and honey nut Cheerios for a good two weeks. It's the only thing I was putting in my body. And because I had my chemo starts so close to my surgery, my wound wasn't closing. So even oh though gosh. I had a drug surgery in September of 2018, late September, 2018, my wound didn't have its last round of stitches taken out until early January of 2018. Sorry, so this was wow. early 2019, 19, sorry. Uh, God, it's been so many years, I don't even- Years get confusing. It's so stressful to have like an open wound, especially like when your body is so weak. I had a very yeah. smelly wound vac. I gained about 60 pounds based on the fluids and steroids in a good eight, nine months. Um, which was really hard on my mental health um, because LA can be a very shallow environment. Um, and so there were just, you know, like all these models walking around <laughs> and I'm, you know, <laughs> bald and no eyebrows and no eyelashes and all this stuff. And I just felt very insecure at the time. And it was, it was really difficult for me. Um, so I went through the nine month map protocol and because there was no evidence of disease anywhere in my body, they were like, you're free. They took my port out. I had my limb salvage, um, in, you know, September of 2018 and, uh, in May of 2019, I was done with chemo, so I thought. Um, I took my port out and I got to go back to school in the fall. And right before I went back to school, they were like, hey, there are like two teeny tiny things in your lungs, could be nothing. Uh, we're just gonna have you fly back down to LA six weeks you know, after that, that scan to see what's going on. So that time comes around. And while I'm at school, it is so much more difficult getting around. Um, because I knew that my knee had hurt before, but now I have a new limb salvage. I got 15 inches of metal in my right leg who I named Rodney, uh, cause it's a rod and a knee. Uh, and again, UW's campus is all hills and stairs. Again, I was on the third floor of my sorority, um, bottom bunk this time though. And, uh, 
it was still really brutal walking around and UW's kind of an older campus. So there's lots of bricks that are uneven, tree roots, it rains a lot, so it's slippery. It was not a good environment for me to be in. Uh, but when I went back in October, um, six weeks after that scan, they were like, there are four things in your lungs now, but they're all really tiny. Uh, let's check again, winter break. Oh, so nice. I kind of knew at that point that it had metastasized. I, I knew in my gut that it was there. And I can't I believe they didn't do anything at four. Yeah, I know. I, I don't really get it either. Um, love my oncologist. I, I, but I think that he didn't really know because a lot of kids have gunk in their lungs and let's be real, weed is legal in Washington. And he didn't know what I was up to when I was <laughs> uh could just be any gunk and from pollution from cities you know people just have gunk in their lungs sometimes uh but yeah so when i got back they scanned and i had 10 tumors um that were visible and so they told me that i needed to have two thoracotomies and go under ice which is ifosfamide carboplatin which is a cousin to cisplatin and etoposide i believe i'm pronouncing that correctly i'm not sure um, and so I did a couple rounds of ice. It didn't really seem to be working. So they decided to go straight into the thoracotomies. Uh, this was in March of 2020. So I had my first thoracotomy, I believe it was March 3rd or 4th of 2020. And a lot of people were being treated for COVID at UCLA because it was the best hospital in the area. Um, so protocols were pretty heavy. And my thoracotomy was scheduled for about six weeks out. And Camille, this is, you know, where I know what it's like to have two thoracotomies within three weeks, because uh, exactly three weeks after my surgery, they called me and said, hi, this is UCLA Santa Monica admissions. Uh, we're here to check you in for your procedure at 730 tomorrow morning. This was at 6 p.m. the night before. Oh, my God. I what? <laughs> what? Uh, and they were like, Oh, has your doctor not called you yet? I'm like, no, she has not. <laughs> They're like, well, your thoracotomy is tomorrow. So you at five 30, I had 11 hours of notice before my next it's ridiculous. And my scars look beautiful. I'm very lucky. I had an incredible, incredible medical team. UCLA has been nothing but amazing with me and I'm beyond lucky. Um, but yeah, I just with COVID and my mom had to stay in the room with me the whole time. And my mom was so anxious um, and she gets bad allergies sometimes that one of the days she completely lost her sense of taste and smell. Uh, and so then they had to take her down to the ER to get tested for COVID. And she was just mortified because she was then thinking, what if I got her sick? But it didn't make sense because we hadn't gone anywhere. We hadn't seen anybody and thankfully she was negative but she like i don't know ended up with covid symptoms just because she got tested multiple times and was okay it was very very scary um and after my lung surgery so basically after my second thoracotomy they kept me in the hospital for a much shorter time than the first one uh and they took my epidural out only after five days um, so I was in brutal pain. So for those of you who don't know about thoracotomies, they cut through your back all through the muscle and they do controlled breaks of your ribs to really get in there. Um, so I was healing from broken ribs. I had really bad uh, shoulder pain that was nerve related. Um, my left eye started drooping like crazy. We had to make sure I got an MRI to see if that I didn't have a stroke. I did not. Um, it was just some nerve damage um, that had acquired in my body. I also now sweat more on my right side. Part of that is is linked. I'm not really sure why. I believe it's called Horner syndrome, uh, but that happened. Um, and I gained even more weight and was terribly depressed. I had already had a history of depression and anxiety pre-cancer and I was just miserable. It was the darkest part of my life. I wasn't even watching TV when the TV was on. I was just staring into space next to it. Um, mm -hmm. Ox makes me itchy. Fentanyl makes me itchy. Any opioids makes me want to rip my skin off. Uh, so, I, but it was the only way to manage my pain. So I was really, really going through it at the time. Um, and I just didn't want to be alive anymore and didn't know what was going on. And thankfully I started working with a psychologist at UCLA who works with adolescent and young adult cancer patients. And she really helped turn my life around that and switching around my medications and it really, really helped me a lot. So much so 
that I realized, wait a minute, I think I want to go into the psych field, um, which is really exciting. And during COVID, I did a year online at UW, uh, took a bunch of psych classes, loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, and then I decided to transfer to UC Santa Barbara since it's so much closer to home. Um, and I got in, which was super exciting on my first try, uh, which was great. That was in September of 2021. And I started at UCSB fully online because of COVID and because I was still undergoing treatment. Um, and kind of in between this period of time, I was on a bunch of different regimens. Um, everything you can imagine, Feridac and Belcade, which are multiple myeloma drugs. They tried that on me. I was on Stavarga as well. Um, and it was really, really hard to get some of these drugs um, because insurance didn't cover them. And then I had to appeal to the uh, pharmaceutical company to get them. It's very, very complicated. Um, and finally I switched to Opdivo, which is an immunotherapy. And that really, really started working well for me. Um, and I got really lucky and around July of 2021, my liver enzymes started ticking up a lot, like a noticeable amount. It wasn't just that I had, you know, had too much to drink um, or eaten too much junk food. My liver was not okay. And I had a really, really rare side effect, which is that the immunotherapy caused my own immune system to attack my liver. And so my liver was being attacked by my immune system, which was being beefed up by the immunotherapy. And uh, they put me on really, really high dose steroids. And I hate being on steroids. I hate being on steroids. Uh, I turned into a total chipmunk. So I just was like all, you know, excess water weight in here and in my stomach and my hands and my feet. Um, I lost 70% of my hair from the stress and from the steroids. Um, and it's finally just growing back in. Um, and the steroids made me so immunocompromised that I ended up with sepsis from my own body. Uh, no, it was not from anything external. Um, I had just had a cryogenic ablation, which I've had at least 13 of now. Um, and for those of you who don't know what a cryogenic ablation is, I like to call it the stabby stab freezy freeze. So basically they just sedate you local anesthesia. Um, and then they put a probe in it's all CT guided. So you're constantly being scanned. Um, and so that's how they see what they're doing inside. Um, and they just hit the tumor and they freeze it. Uh, and then that'll melt and it kills the cancer cells um, and it preserves a lot of the healthy tissue. So it's a really, really great way to get in to those like peripheral lung tumors that are on the smaller side. Um, and it's a really easy outpatient procedure and I'll be home probably by three or four that same afternoon if I have you know the first procedure of the day. Um, so I had just had uh, probably what was like my ninth ablation in my, in my right lung. And I woke up on October 17th at 2.30 in the morning. Um, I was sleeping in my mom's room because she likes to keep an eye on me after surgery. And I had a really bad wet cough. And I was like, oh my God, I have COVID. She's like, I don't think you have COVID. You haven't been anywhere. I don't think you have COVID. I was coughing, my ribs hurt. I was exhausted. I could tell my blood pressure was low. And my mom was like, we have to go to the emergency room. I was like, please, I don't want to go to the ER. She's like, we're going. So we go. And turns out, glad we went. Uh, I was in septic shock. I had pneumonia. My left lung had collapsed. And I, my blood oxygen levels dropping very, very quickly. Um, so I had to be intubated and taken to the ICU. So I was on a ventilator for six days. Um, my fever hit 105.3. They had to wrap me in cold blankets to get my temperature to go down. And there were two or three nights where they really think I didn't, they thought that I didn't, wouldn't make it through the night. Um, and then I got off the ventilator and that same day I stood up for the first time and started walking a little bit, just bit by bit. My muscles had atrophied so much. It was brutal. Um, but I was out of the hospital 12 days after I got there. And maybe that was a little too soon. Mm -hmm. I ended up in the hospital three days later. <laughs> um, but uh, that was more for more liver stuff. And they tried me on this drug called ATG, um, which is where they put human T cells into like a horse or a rabbit. I think, I think mine was the rabbit version. And then their immune system will counter the human T cells. 
and then they take blood from the animal and spin out the antibodies that fight human T cells and they'll give that to you. And so that finally started to make my liver enzymes go down. And to tell you how high my liver enzymes were, uh, average for AST, I believe is 13 to 80. And for ALT, it's about 12 to 62. Uh, my AST at its highest was 1,150 and my ALT at its highest was about 4,300. Um, so way more normal. And miraculously, yeah. my liver had no permanent damage. Um, but I was on high-dose steroids for months. I was like a chihuahua, a vibrating chihuahua mixed with the Incredible Hulk. I mean, like I was just an irritable mess. I had to be moving constantly. I, I lost 20 pounds just from how much I was walking. Um, and I think I was averaging about 12,000 steps a day in the hospital. I was in the hospital for three weeks oh, and would do- Where do you even go in the hospital? Laps of the floor, just laps of the floor over and over again, sometimes with a walker, sometimes without. And it was a really, really rough time. And what finally got my liver better was a kidney transplant rejection drug that keeps your organs, so that keeps your immune system from attacking your organs. And it's a very, very rare drug to get unless you have a kidney transplant. And they tried it on me. I did about five infusions of it. And suddenly my liver was pretty much back to normal. Um, and as of January, I have been off steroids completely. And as of this February, I am no longer on any immunosuppressants with no plans for any more systemic treatment. Um, I do have an ablation coming up uh, on April 27th, um, which I believe will be the day before this posts. So very excited for that. the biggest hugs. Woo! Yes. Um, but yeah, it's been a whirlwind of a journey to say the least, um, but I'm just hanging out at home right now. I took the year off of school just to kind of recoup. Um, I'm starting again at UCSB, ideally online in the fall, which is really exciting. And I'll probably be transferring again to CSUN, um, which is Cal State Northridge, um, just to be even closer to home. It's only 20 minutes from the house. Um, so I can be with my mom and the pets and close to treatment. And I have very, very few lung mets right now. And they're just picking them off with ablations. And as my best friend likes to say, I'm flirting with permission. Uh, it's the only, it's the only good flirting <laughs> that I have in my arsenal. But uh, yeah. And I, I'm just working with MIB and excited to be here with all of you. So Vicki, I want to hear about your story. Yeah. I mean, it's so exciting hearing from your story, like the random different things that they use, like a anti-rejection kidney transplant drug. And like, you wouldn't think that something like that would work, but no. if it works, it works. We're going to take it, whatever we can get. But that's, <laughs> that's awesome. Liver. Yeah, totally. Um, so I guess for starting on my story, hi everyone, I'm Vicki. Um, I am currently 18 and will be at Villanova in the fall. Had to take a year off because of uh, osteo, but I grew up uh, about half an hour from New York City, give or take sometimes an hour and a half with traffic. Ooh, <laughs> can get rough, but um, I was always uh, very athletic, especially going into high school. I was the captain of the, the rowing team. I ran um, another high school girls lifting club. I was helping out with the, uh, the fitness club that I also run at like peak fitness. I won a national like boat title my sophomore year. And then right before COVID, the women's state lightweight title for rowing. So I was, I was really invested in sports and I just really enjoyed it too. It was definitely a great way for me to de-stress. Um, and so how osteo kind of comes into my story is I began training for uh, my senior year in winter. I was just lifting by myself because we were still in the peak of COVID. So what weren't really going out as a team altogether since it wasn't safe. But while I was lifting by myself, I had a constant pain in my left hip. But obviously, if I was doing athletics all the time, I thought it was an injury, as most people do. Um, so I ended up going to physical therapy, uh, went to physical therapy for four months straight. Issue only got worse. I really should have figured it out sooner because four months was kind of a long time to be going to something that's not working. I don't know why I kept going, but 
I, I kept, <laughs> yeah, I kept going. I was really hoping it was an injury. I kept rowing. Um, I eventually committed to Villanova for Division One rowing, Ooh. which sadly can't do anymore. But so excited to get that offer. Um, but I, I sort of knew something was up the whole time. Like I just had so much pain in my left hip. But this was also the end of my senior year of high school, and I told myself I'm I'm going to graduate. I'm going to you know make sure that I go through all the normal events that everyone gets gets to go through because I don't want something to stop that. Um, so I ended up graduating. Um, and then took things seriously right after I graduated, got the scans, and then was diagnosed with um, metastatic spindle cell sarcoma in my pelvis and lungs. And this was some, at some point in July of 2021. Um, and then I started MAP uh, that same month. It did take uh, a long time though, since they weren't sure exactly what it was. They took a, um, a biopsy and then they were like, okay, it's gonna take two weeks to figure out what it was. So they went there um, into the lab and they're like, oh, we're, we're not actually quite sure. We're gonna send it to someone else. So then they sent it to this, um, this other doctor at, I forget the hospital name, some other hospital in Boston for Dana women and Farber? children. What? Dana Farber? I, I don't really remember, oh, but they sent women? it there. Huh? Was it Brigham and Women's? Oh, yeah, that's that's it. That's it. So they sent it there, and he came back saying that it was um, spindle cell. So there was, there's not really a treatment plan for spindle cell sarcoma. They just treat it as osteosarcoma because it's only, I think you're missing osteoid cells. I think that's what they're called. So it's, it's very, very similar tumor. Um, but anyways, I started... MAP treatment and immediately I hated the hospital I was at because uh, I was getting treatment at a hospital in New Jersey. I won't say their name because um, obviously people get treated there and enjoy their experience, not enjoy the experience, but you know, they, they get through it all right. But um, I changed to Memorial Sloan in the city, which very lucky to be able to go there. And immediately they changed the diagnosis to osteosarcoma, even though they didn't take a different biopsy. They were like, I'm sure this is um, osteosarcoma. This has all the characteristics of it. Definitely will be. And then they also took out one of the methotrexates because usually you would get cisplatin and doxorubicin and then two separate methotrexates. But I would take up to 10 days to clear methotrexate in the hospital. And they just didn't think it would be, um, not they didn't think it would be, they just knew that if you kept running leucovorin for that long, like 10 days, break for two days, and then another 10 days, it just wouldn't be efficient. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, my kidneys are happy that I decided to just go down to one, but it, it would have been too much for my body to handle. So that was, that was a big change that was made, which I definitely appreciated. Um, and then November, 2021, I had my limb salvage. Uh, I don't really have an option for any other surgery since it was taking out my pelvis. Yeah, it kind of protects a lot of my organs. So that wasn't an option, but that was, that was a brutal surgery. Um, you couldn't bend at the waist. There was a lot of nerve complications. Like I think, I think it was maybe like a week or two before I could like start you know, bending at all. Wow. Cause you don't, you don't realize how much like you use your hip until like something's affected it. But anyway, that happened. There was a lot of other nerve complications where like my muscles would like start seizing randomly. I don't know if anyone else has experienced that. Well, that's from it. But, yeah. It's, I didn't, I like really didn't expect that to happen. Another, another thing I didn't realize would happen when I came out of surgery, since I think my limb salvage was 20 hours mm -hmm. um, wow. and it was yeah it it was wild um well I say it was wild I was out for all of it but your poor parents in the waiting room though yeah Kerrigan's face said it all right there I mean yeah. <laughs> like even if I'm in a surgery for an hour my parents are like no my parents just like, went home really oh. yeah respect they just went home <laughs> and then they, cut, they came back the next morning I think well, I got out like, hands. yeah, well, it started at like 7am 
and then it finished at like two or three a.m. So they they weren't gonna stay for the whole thing. That is- but when I came into that, I had so much pain on my right shoulder because they didn't think to move me at all during surgery. Yep. Yeah. So oh, there's a word for that type of pain, and I'm blanking on what it is. I think it starts yeah. with like referred pain or something. Yes, referred pain. Yeah. And it's because your body doesn't know what's going on, especially if you have a lot of like opioids in your system or if there's been like your nerves are just in shock. Uh, for some reason, it goes to the shoulders a lot. Really? Mm-hmm. I thought it was just because I was lying on it because that's where all the pressure it, it, was. Definitely that too. That that, that definitely hurts. Yeah, like yeah. A mixture. It, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, back to back to the story. Um, I then continued with map treatment and then I had a thoracotomy in January of 2022 Mm -hmm. because they told me that it was uh, metastatic they told me that I had two nodules in my lungs and then when I ended up coming out of surgery um, they said oh we actually removed three and I was like not something I wanted to hear but like great that you got everything out Um, but then two weeks later we found out that um, all the nodules were non-cancerous that they were just scar tissue from things. We would love to hear that. Yeah, yeah, like that's great news. But it was, you know, quite, quite far into my treatment that I've just been told that oh, you just, you know, you've localized cancer. Like it's not metastatic. And a lot of people are like, oh, that, that, that's so awesome. Like I bet you were so excited. But my brain was just kind of like, are you sure? Like, so I had like accepted the fact that it was metastatic. So it was definitely a, a strange day of that one. But appreciate that you don't really hear that type of um event happening a lot in the cancer world but after that um continued on with more chemo and I am in my last round of map right now and I have one methotrexate left uh, can't wait for it to I say this now can't wait for it to be done I really hope but Only um and of Mountain Dew pee <laughs> what Only one more round of Mountain Dew oh. pee yeah i forget that um doxorubicin also affects when you go to the bathroom too and it's like bright red that caught me yeah. off yeah. i remember this it's terrifying i kind of I forgot about yeah. that <laughs> so long ago it's so bad but i'm also getting back into working out right now when i have the energy get to lift upper body do my stationary bike swimming can't row anymore a lot of things I can't do though, which is I'm trying to decide where I want to go, you know, in sports and activity kind of moving forward. Cause it's kind of, it's put me in the position where you're not like totally able-bodied after having um, limb salvaged for obvious reasons, but you're also not, you're not like disabled as like an amputee athlete. So there's like different categories, I guess, for athletics. So I'm kind of just trying to find where I would work best and like what kind of sport yeah. I could look to do. So it's have any... on a spectrum. So what? disability is completely on a spectrum. Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah, it's just there's not that many other people with. I guess all of their limbs, you know? Yeah, I guess it's hard to. Yeah, well, there definitely are other people that are out there, but it's very small community. And it's hard to like fully know that someone's disabled because, you know, if you're wearing pants, like you can't see a scar, you can't see a limb salvage scar. Um, exactly. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I had a dollar for every time someone got mad at me for using my disability parking blocker. Oh, so really? true. I could probably get a new car. No, that's an exaggeration, but you know, <laughs> yeah. Wow. I feel like if anyone were ever to say that to me, I would immediately just like, rip off the wig and be like, huh? I'm going to say that again, you know? <laughs> you just say to me? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, that's that's kind of where my story is now. Also talking about the disability placard, because obviously like I'm an amputee, so I park right in the handicap parking. You know, I look like I'm a normal 21-year-old girl. I pull up blasting my music, jamming, and then you know, I'll pull up right next to this old man and I'll get these dirty looks. And then I go out and I'm like, psych, I have one leg, but you do get dirty looks. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I think I recently read something. I, I think I actually saw a TikTok, and it was like 
someone describing the story that they saw on Reddit and someone got yelled at um, for parking in the disability area and they just took off their leg. Oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) The the bird. Like whacked them with it. Yeah. No, I was like, oh, that's genius. Dang. I feel like people always expect if you're going to park there that you're like in a wheelchair, but there's so many other forms of disability that are able to use those. And, and also, you know, a lot of us have had a lot of trauma to our lungs. And if you have to walk yeah. long distances, that's cardiovascular exercise, yeah. especially if your muscles have atrophied. So if you're, you know, even three months post a thoracotomy, walking a long distance is not going to be easier on your body because your lungs have to work so hard. Right. And, you know, Very the, true. holding your body up with the muscles in your back and your ribs might still hurt. I mean, it's a lot of, there are a lot of in, invisible disabilities out there. Yeah, yeah. Are. people don't consider. I, I wanted to be a disability studies minor, but UCSB does not have it. You dubbed it. So if anyone has any questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello, my name is Kerrigan. I am from the smallest state with the biggest heart, Rhode Island. I'm 21 <laughs> years old and I'm an above the knee amputee as well as fighting relapsed metastatic osteosarcoma for the third time. I've been to 43 states and traveled all over Canada. I have a passion for animals and I'm a singer who has performed regionally for the past decade. My childhood was busy with taking dance and swimming lessons as well as earning my black belt in Taekwondo. Um, I thought I was pretty badass. I broke a lot of boards and (laughs) won a lot of gold medals, not to brag or anything. And not only did I do Taekwondo and dance, but I competed in pageants and I met a lot of my lifetime friends through pageants. Um, I've always been really outgoing and super positive. In 2019, I started getting very tired easily and my left leg started becoming painful. I had to quit dance and Taekwondo because I struggled to keep up um, in class and the pain was just intolerable. Um, I remember telling my parents that, hey, I can no longer go to Taekwondo or dance. I don't know what it is. I must have injured myself, but I need a break for now and I need to go to the doctors and get checked out. Um, I also had trouble sleeping at night. I would wake up in the middle of the night and I'd have to like switch sides, put a pillow under my left leg, which had the tumor in it at the time, but I didn't know. And um, I just, I was sleeping all the time. We would be at an amusement park. Say we were at somewhere like Disney where you wanna spend the whole day there. I would have to go back to the room and sleep for half of the day. Um, Things were just not adding up. Um, My parents and friends actually thought that I was depressed because I ended up canceling a lot of plans due to my leg hurting or due to me sleeping. Even before um, small things like singing at a restaurant, I would have to take a nap then I would sing at the restaurant, then I'd come back and take a nap, just sleeping all the time. I also looked very pale. Um, You know, when you're sick and you just have that like green palish look, I just had that all the time. Um, Eventually I felt a lump on the left side of my leg and I started going back and forth to the doctors and the ER. I was misdiagnosed for six months as having a scorch injury. I would usually leave the doctors in the hospital being told that I had a strained muscle or something similar which is so common in osteosarcoma. Um, X-rays and blood work revealed nothing. I would feel feeling really defeated. I mean, I would feel leave, I would feel leaving very defeated. Also my X-ray, they did an X-ray and nothing showed up in the X-ray because the tumor was hiding behind the bone. Yeah, and osteosarcoma is most commonly diagnosed as a sports injury. I remember that there was a turning point for me. I had, I had gone to the mall with my friends and I couldn't keep up with them. And I had to keep sitting down because I was in too much pain to walk. I was 18 years old and I had zero energy. I remember saying to my mom, nothing is adding up. Um, this bump feels deep inside my bone and I think I have cancer. If we don't get answers soon, you're going to lose me. I've always been super in tune with my body. Mm-hmm. And somehow I just knew that something is wrong because we were just, we just weren't getting the correct answers. And it's just like, I feel like everyone has that moment where you're like, oh my gosh, this something's, something's most definitely wrong because I'm not, I'm not healing PT, nothing else is working. 
Um, so the next day I ended up going to the ER and I didn't leave until I had scans and an answer. Um, insurance initially had denied um, a CT scan, which was needed to determine if it was a tumor or not. And I remember breaking down because I knew that was probably going to give me an answer. March 15th, 2019, I found out that I had cancer. A biopsy what needed, was needed to confirm osteosarcoma. sarcoma. Surgery revealed almost a grapefruit sized tumor hidden beneath my kneecap. Jeez. Yeah. Grapefruit? Yeah. It's not freaking huge. And it didn't show up on the x ray. It's crazy. Yeah. Let's see. My treatment had consisted over three years of high dose chemotherapy, 18 surgeries, including two FemLoud. Sorry. 18 surgeries, including two failed limb salvage surgeries and above the knee amputation, two lung surgeries. And I had almost lost my life um, on several occasions due to infection, including sepsis. And I know that we can probably all talk about that um, really quickly because limb salvage surgery always leads to infection. Pretty much always. Yeah. Yeah. It's and sepsis sucks. There are different levels of sepsis. Yeah. It always sucks. That's the only common theme about sepsis. Awful. So scary. Especially like when you find out that you have sepsis because you know, sepsis is like so terrible. So it just, you immediately just feel even more terrible. Um, I had to deal with harsh side effects such as hair loss, extreme nausea, fatigue, mouth sores, hearing loss, chemo fog and more. Yep. I have PTSD and anxiety. I also deal with a lot of weight gain, which I did not think I was going to happen. I thought I was going to lose a lot of weight and that's what I was prepared for. Um, expect. But with the steroids, I mean, to talk about the steroids for one second, the steroids would keep me up at night. They would yep. make me super angry. I was all, I was also sweating all the time. I would have to sometimes like change my clothes in the middle of the night or my sheets. So that, that was crazy. Um, I also went on a medication to stop my period during it. So that put me into early menopause. So I had all the symptoms of that. Um, do you know what that's called Mia? Uh, Lupron. Did you have the Lupron? Yes. Shot? That's what I had. Yes. I was on the every month Lupron Same. shots and hot flashes, you're sweaty, your metabolism slows down. It's literally menopause. Yeah. I, I, I was on and off Lupron three times. So I am 23 years old and oh. I've been through menopause three times. <laughs> just the cherry on top. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah just why not add that to the mix, right? <laughs> super cute. So Kerrigan, I feel you with the steroids and the Lupron because shit's brutal. Yeah. And um, most recently, I had one of my ovaries removed to preserve my eggs. Mm -hmm. um, and the way they explained it to me, they were like, all right, so we're just going to take your ovary out through your belly button. I didn't even realize your ovary was small enough to like go through your belly button. They're like, yep, we just fold it. And then they boom. And that's literally how it was explained to me. They were like, just, they were just like, boink. And I was like, great, but I'm missing an ovary but we'll have to see because it's in the freezer right now. So we'll have to see down the road if it uh, ends up working. Um, I'm currently doing all right. My cancer has been deemed incurable, but I remain optimistic and hopeful. I'm currently on an oral, um, I'm currently on an oral maintenance chemo that I have tolerated fairly well other than exhaustion, slight nausea and a sore throat. I've been working on social media and singing at local restaurants and coffee shops quite a bit. Um, that singing has been really helpful for me because it's one of the things that I can still do, even though I'm an amputee, I obviously, um, can't do Taekwondo and dance. I may be able to do it, but I might have to do it differently. And it, it, for me, it will never feel the same. So singing, mm -hmm. singing is something that has stayed the same that I can still do. I'll be resuming college in fall. I'm excited to volunteer my time as a pediatric cancer advocate. And something that I learned is that I have cancer, but cancer does not have me. It is a big portion of my life, but there is more to me than just cancer. Yeah, there uh, is. Right? Oh, yeah. I do not let it define me. I've also learned that everyone is going through something and has their own story. And I've also noticed a lot. My friends um, don't like coming to me for issues because they're like, 
cancer is so much worse than your, what you're dealing with. But I mean, everyone's dealing with their own thing and it's okay to come to me about it. Have you guys like had something similar to that when someone wants to like tell you something that's going on in their life, but they're like, I don't want to tell you because it's nothing like what you're dealing with. Yeah. And, and what a lot of people don't realize a lot of people who aren't going through it, um, is that that's part of friendship. That is part of camaraderie is sharing what you're going through. And that mutual exchange of information is what builds deeper connections. And when you lose that, you end up feeling more disconnected. And so you want to hear people out because you're still human. You aren't your cancer. Like you said, I have the cancer, but the cancer doesn't have me. I am still able to be a good friend and a good listener. While exactly. Preach. Yeah, I, right. exactly. Um, I have also, the, oh, sorry. Sorry. Camille. I didn't want to say this because it's kind of Okay, cut this out, guys. Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum, there's the people that see you as like a big inspiration and wise person that they come and talk, they just spill all of their life details onto you and don't even ask you how you're doing. Yeah. I've had like one person kind of do that to me. And I'm just like, I am not your hero. This happened to me. I did not choose for this to happen to me. Exactly. And I'm just trying to live. Like, I don't know. I, I, it's obviously a part of friendship, the camaraderie of it, but it's a give and take situation. Like I'm not here. I'm not your therapist. This, I, you know, like, like what, what is this, sir? Like, you know, that's what I'm thinking. That's <laughs> yeah, what I'm thinking. Literally. The other day I had someone DM me on Instagram. They sent me like 20 different text messages and they are just talking about how their cat had leukemia. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. When someone's like, oh, I know yeah. where you're going. My cat has leukemia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. I I've know. never I heard it for like a pet though. Like I've heard like, oh, like my mom or like my friend's my grandma. sister. Okay. Yeah. More dogs Not the cat. have sarcoma than people. Yes. That's wild. When you like look up the hashtag osteosarcoma, there's more pictures of dogs than actual <laughs> yeah. people. I'm like, I'm not that much of a bitch, am I? You know, like it's like <laughs> oh man. <Mia>. Literally. <laughs> you know? I know. I know. It's crazy. Ugh. Osteo is a sneaky little bitch. Yeah. <laughs> also from osteo, I've learned to advocate for myself in the medical world. When I had first just started going to the doctors in the hospital, my mom would speak for me. It was like one of those situations where you're at the doctors and they're like, what are your symptoms? And you look over to your mom and then she relates it for you. I was in that position. doesn't matter how old you are. It's always going to be like that. I still do it. I I still still do do it. it. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it, it is fine, but I've definitely learned to advocate for myself and like speak up. Um, even when, you know, they don't want to do another scan and something feels wrong in my chest or my um, residual limb, I'll speak up and say, I think this would be beneficial for myself. And I've also learned that life is so precious. You never know what's going to happen. You have to treat every day like it's your last. I mean, things change so quickly. So, I mean, just enjoying the small moments in life, even like when you're going through methotrexate and doxorubicin, cisplatin, you're in the hospital for a long time. Um, and even just when you first step out and smell the fresh air, like I appreciate that. Um, yeah, there's a photo of me with my, like sticking my head out of the, the car as if I was like a dog. And I was like, oh, the fresh air, you know, it's like 10 days later. You will learn, you learn to appreciate the small things. But yeah, that's my story. And that's what I've learned. You, you all are such amazing women. I am so honored to know all of you truly from the deepest part of my hearts and we we are those bitches like we we are those bitches like cancer is a but we are the badder bitches like let's be real here like we're getting through this we're getting on with our lives kerrigan i love that you know that i i have cancer the cancer doesn't have me i am obsessed with that also psa for everybody out here watching uh, do not send us Rachel Platten's fight song for the love of God. <laughs> if I hear that song one more time, I'm going to wish that the cancer did kill me. Like I genuinely, <laughs> please, it is a running joke in my family. My mom wrote it on my birthday card. She wrote out 
the entire thing. All the lyrics. Oh, my wow. birthday. Like, sweetie, I'm so proud of you for making it to 23. I just want you to know that I can't even remember the first line right now, but she just wrote every single word for it. Ugh, my friends. I feel like all of us here do really well with dark humor. And yeah. some of my friends will be oh, surprised absolutely. on like what I'm saying because um, I follow the cancer patient on Instagram and some of the Yo, stuff. Shout out. Say, it's like, do- <laughs> yeah. I mean, some of my friends are like, oh my gosh, like, I can't believe you just said that. But now, now they're kind of roped in and now they kind of make up their own dark humor jokes. Good. <laughs> Good. As they should. Yeah. Yes. One of my best friends nicknamed me cue ball when I was bald and she still signs any card that she sends to me. You know, she addresses it to cue ball. Oh my God. Um, I love hysterical Cause I was so pale and so bald. We actually went to Coachella together in 2019 which was an ordeal. Let me tell you, going to Coachella after a limb salvage surgery, again, it's because it's Coachella weekend right now, weekend two. Um, I went in 2019, I went in 2017, my senior year of high school pre-cancer, and I went post-cancer. One of the first things I asked my oncologist after being diagnosed, can I still go to Coachella in April? This was in (laughs) September. I bought my tickets like in June, because that's when pre-sale is. So before I was even diagnosed, I was like, I'm going to Coachella with my friends. Uh, chemo is not going to stop me. So I'm super bald, no eyebrows. And my friend Lindsay was in, you know, did a lot of theater stuff. So she drew eyebrows on me every single morning before we went, which was so sweet. And my Instagram caption was actually fake eyebrows, real friends. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. I don't even know how you do that because like I'm I'm following influencers right now on TikTok and YouTube and they can't even do Coachella. They're they're leaving because of all the dust in their lungs. So I don't even know how you did that. It's really windy in Southern California. Uh there there have been power outages by me. So I've been worried there wasn't gonna make it today. So <laughs> but I'm here. So as you guys know, you are all you all mean so much to me. So does MIB. Um, and I'm really excited for the Factor Conference this year. Uh, it's going to be June 23rd through 25th at the Rancho Bernardo Inn in San Diego, right outside San Diego. MIB will be hosting its annual Factor Conference. It's the only osteosarcoma conference. And in addition to the top osteosarcoma re- researchers and clinicians, patients and families will also attend. There's a Warrior HQ free to patients. And we will have a lot of mindfulness activities if you don't want to sit and listen to the researchers. And it's just going to be a grand old time. It's a great place for, you know, people going through osteo, people whose families have been affected by it, just to bond and connect. And I am so excited. How many of you are attending? I'm going. I might. I might. But I will be my summer semester. I was thinking, I was having a little idea what this is just like maybe like maybe we could pull this off like what if we split like hotel room costs like if we stayed in the same hotel no because I was thinking of texting you that and we'll have to talk about this later we'll talk we'll talk offline we'll talk and offline. they were roommates <laughs> and, they were roommates. and they were roommates I'm I'm snuggly like I will hands down snuggly. Uh, uh, we'll share like a king <laughs> bed it'll be so slay oh yeah Perfect. Real hot <laughs> All right. Now that you guys know a little bit about our stories, we are going to talk about something that I know for me kind of dominates my life um, going through cancer treatment, and that is FOMO. And for those of you that don't know what FOMO is, it's an abbreviation for the fear of missing out. Um, And, you know, I think it's something that cancer patients all have experienced in some way, shape, or form. And to be honest, I kind of know it up close and personal. Go Tom Yen. I feel like having osteo makes it very difficult because of the ages that it usually affects. Because when you're, when you're a little kid going through cancer, like if people bring you crafts or like, you know, art projects to do, you're like easily distracted by it. And when you're kind of um, an older adult who has maybe their own kids who are grown up or you know, you have someone around you that's experienced someone else going through cancer, you can usually handle the situation a little better. Whereas a lot of us, all of us have kind of been 
put in a situation where our friends are kind of going off starting the next phase of their life, you know, with college and, you know, hanging out. And a lot of times you can't be there and there's not always things they can do to accommodate that. And it's, it gets very difficult. I don't know about you guys, but uh, social media is a blessing and a curse because it keeps you connected with your friends. But when you're in a hospital bed, you've got chemo dripping into you. The last thing you want to see is people spring break pictures. You know, like I've got, you know, girls from my sorority. They're like spring break, Cancun. We're getting drunk, we're having fun. Literally. Bald and bloated and exhausted and trying not to puke. And I mean, they're trying not to puke either, but for a completely different reason. <laughs> and it's just kind of heartbreaking. You know, you, you're seeing people, especially, you know, with COVID, you know, people still seeing their families. I, could, I couldn't I could see anybody during COVID because my lungs were so fragile and so was my immune system. And so what I ended up doing is creating a separate Instagram account, almost like a Finsta, where I was only following the funny accounts on Instagram and none of the people that I knew. And so that way I could still feel connected with the world without being bombarded by bikini pictures and you know people traveling the world, which is something that I love to do. So that is such a good idea. And I don't know how I haven't thought of that, but I've been kind of taking to Pinterest recently, but it's not kind of the content I want. I want the dark humor, funny meme content. So I might just have to make a little account and do that because I'm getting spammed with like parties. And there's this thing in Boston called Marmon. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but basically the the Boston Marathon just happened in Boston, obviously. And there's a college tradition that you get up at 5 a.m. when the runners start running and you just start partying. And by 11 a.m. when they're finished, you are passed out drunk. Um, Very you know, <laughs> I'm not like I'm not really down for that. I'm on so many medications. And I'm certainly not waking up at 5 a.m. I need like 10 to 12 hours of sleep just to function and lay in my bed. Same like thing. I'll probably need 14 to like actually get up and do stuff. So I don't know where I was going with that, but <laughs> anyway. No, oh, it's like, why is that appearing on your feed? Like if that's, it's not what you're partaking in. You're looking for dark humor. And you know, like we, we don't have any control over the Instagram algorithm, right? Like we can't, we can't control it. And so, you know, it's just kind of hard because you follow the accounts you like think would show up, but then it's just all of these bikini pictures, vacation pictures, party pictures. And meme pages are posting all these thirst traps of these OnlyFans girls. And it's like, they're hot. Don't get me wrong. Like go off, slay. I get it. You want to make money advertising, but what gives, you know, like, I'm not here to see that kind of content, nothing right. against it, but you know, if, if you're, if you're struggling with, you know, your body confidence, it's not really what you want to see. And like, you don't want to delete it either because that's how, you know, what everyone's up to and everything, even like seeing prom pictures, mm-hmm. just events that you can't go to that just like that hits a spot so deep down in yourself. And it, it's just so crushing especially since we're at that age where all of us like the college experience with like parties and everything like we're fighting for our life like there's parties that we can go to I mean like I haven't even been able to go to college yet because of um you know cancer and everything so I've just been doing online classes here and there but I it's a crushing feeling you know you know I I do have to say it's a completely crushing feeling but there ain't no party like a cancer patient party Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> I'll stop and everyone goes to bed at a reasonable hour. So <laughs> you get to have fun. You get to commiserate with people. You get to have fun. I already said that. Yep. It's super fun. You get to drink if you can, if you want to. <laughs> can't. It's no big because everyone's been there. So shout out, actor. <laughs> shout out to my cancer clinic friends you guys know who you are we have this tradition every year it's called cancer christmas we do a little yankee swap <laughs> moment and we kind of it's like the one time we get to catch up on each other's lives um so if y'all are listening camille y'all. add me to that i literally will oh my god i know they would love you 
so gay. Okay. <laughs> so Perfect. Gay for that. Most of my cancer friends are dead from home. So, mm. so, so we can't really do that, but I still have a couple left. <laughs> I'm alive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, we're we alive. My cancer friends. I meant local. I'm local. I'm a local. Dollar, oh dollar bar. Yeah. Y'all need to come yeah. to LA. We'll definitely, like, we'll definitely have to talk about, you know, that side of cancer too. Um, because I feel like that could be like a two hour long discussion of, you know, the the risk you take when you make friends that have can that have cancer. Um yeah. it's you know, it's a whole other battle and I think we'll definitely have to talk about it. Um, oh, yeah. But I feel like, you know, recognizing that FOMO is an issue and, you know, um, you know, sulking in it is one thing, but I am a lover of solutions and um, figuring out ways to cope. Um, so let's talk a little bit about combating FOMO. So, okay, recognizing FOMO is going on in your life is one thing and sulking in it and feeling all the feelings that come up is one thing but I ultimately am a lover of solutions and trying to cope through it and making life more fun um so for me I feel like there comes a point in life where acceptance is the only way through um throughout our episodes you're gonna hear me talking a lot about mental health and a lot about acceptance. I love acceptance because so hot although right. <laughs> we love acceptance um, and it doesn't come easily. Do not get me wrong, nah. but <laughs> it, it doesn't mean that you're not allowed to feel your feelings. Like you can still be sad or angry or however you're feeling about the situation. But for me, it's about learning to stop fighting against reality because you you come to a point where you're trapped in this cycle of suffering and just soaking in it and everything is just so much harder and so we've got to adapt right we have to adapt to what our lives are and you know um certainly for me I have a lot of friends um I've met in college college has been really exciting for me you're um, so similar. <laughs> yes, I'm a psych major. And um I am a very I'm very involved in theater. You know, I have several groups of friends and you know, just explaining to them, like, hey, like I have cancer, like this is how it's impacting me right now, and really advocating for your needs. Like, you know, in March I had my scan and I was like, hey guys, like, can we get dinner tonight? Because I'm having a lot of anxiety because I have. I'm waiting on the scanners all like would that be possible and everyone's been so nice and so accommodating and I feel like accepting that phone was a thing is one and then figuring out ways to combat it in your life like you know connecting with friends doing what you can to I don't know just live life because that's what it's all about in the end could not agree more yeah I think it's so big to just realize that your life's going to be on pause for a minute while you're going through treatment and there's going to be ups and downs along the way too and can't always be with everyone but there's definitely ways that you can feel better about the situation you're in and talk to everyone else about you around it. Cancer when you're our age is a semicolon and not a period. It is a pause exactly like you said, where it separates two clauses, it separates two different parts of your life, but it is not the end of it, always. And on that note, thank you all so much for tuning into our first episode of Osteo, the Osteosarcoma podcast. Just a reminder that this is a monthly podcast that is published right here on MIB socials. Be sure to follow MIB agents on social media at the links in our description for all of the intel. In the meantime, we are your hosts, Camille, Vicky, Mia, Arrogant. Oh. <laughs> that about sums up the podcast. Um, <laughs> and until next time, that's the tea. Bye. Bye, lovelies. <laughs>